Can you hear me? All good? Awesome. Well, I'm really happy to be here in Paris, uh, even with uh, all the trouble that I had to uh, just come here. I mean, there's always some, uh, some strike going on in this city. Uh, I hope we don't, we don't get that in GraphQL. We all agree how we should use GraphQL. And today I'm going to talk about how I use GraphQL to um, do uh, application with uh, geolocation uh, enabled. And I've done geolocation for two years um, at a security company tracking uh, devices, and I'm going to use that uh, to show you the demo that I built for this conference. So let's start first with uh, the most important bit, which is uh, my name. And besides what you can think, I'm not French. I was, <laughs> I mean, this is a very French name somehow, but I'm not French, I was born in Barcelona. And my name pronounced in Catalan is Jarar Sanz. Jarar Sanz. Okay. <laughs> or you can use Gerard Sanz. Something like that. No? Very good. <laughs> okay. I mean, this is going to be hard. So. I'm a developer advocate at AWS, and you can see that I have a lot of time of uh, myself doing selfies uh, with my cat. <laughs> I'm a cat person uh, for all the cat lovers. I've been doing um, full-time talks for the last four years, so I've been pretty busy, as you can see from this, uh, from this map. There's still some areas which I haven't visited yet, so I can still uh, keep keep on going. So I'm going to talk about bike sharing. And I also seen that you also have here uh, a bike scheme sharing in, uh, in Paris. So you will be familiar with it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the scheme running in uh, London. And this is the Santander bikes. And they look like this. So this is a picture of one of the dock stations. And of course, after a few years of using uh, one of these um, uh, programs uh, to share bikes, it starts becoming part of, uh, of the culture. And you can see people taking pictures with the bikes. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you use these bikes. People going crazy. Uh, this must be something I don't understand. I mean, this is some kind of British uh, celebration of hats. Uh, and obviously, you need to use a bike <laughs> just to get in trouble. And uh, of course, yeah, if you go to a park in London, there will be some squirrels also using the bike, uh, the bike somehow. Uh, they are not paying, for sure. So some benefits of this um, are transport flexibility. I mean, this is a modern solution that we can see in many cities. Uh, reduce traffic emissions, uh, pollution. There's also a chance to reduce traffic uh, congestion. So this is all nice. Uh, health benefits also for the users, besides the accidents, of course. And the Santander bike cycles, uh, they, they use this logo. So this is just a small intro, how this looks. It started a few years back, so now it's quite mature, I would say. There's 12,000 bikes. Um, being uh, monitored by, uh, by the system, and 778 stations. And this is uh, actually the use case that I'm, I'm going to uh, develop uh, in this talk. So this is quite a lot of uh, data, and I'm going to hook into the API that is going to give me that information. One thing that I want you to think about is we cannot access the whole uh, data set. I mean, if we want to get the information for all of the stations, we have, a, we have a problem because we cannot load that information in a meaningful way or at least in the time that is uh, meaningful for the user uh, to be responsive. So we need to solve these uh, data uh, issues. And I'm going to use GraphQL to do that. Um, this this uh, 
bike sharing scheme was also named as the as the mayor in London. And I'm just going to uh, to show you how he's welcome in the city. Yeah, this is what happens. I think he takes this really well. So this is, a, this is the application that I'm going to build, London Bikes. And I spent some time building the logo. I hope you, you enjoy it. This is just one slide. <laughs> so I'm going to be using full stack serverless. And this is a, this is a new paradigm that it's coming. And probably you have uh, seen serverless alone. But full stack serverless is just having access to the full stack. So you can build serverless applications and also have all the tooling supporting the front end. Um, and why is that important? Well, usually if you want to get into serverless, it will take you uh, quite an effort. But now that's, that's becoming uh, easier and easier. And I'm going to show you a tool that will help you to, uh, to get there, to get to a full stack serverless solution. And OK, serverless, and it's, OK, I didn't mean to show a dollar there, but yeah. So one thing that serverless brings is that you don't have to manage these servers. So for example, when we were seeing uh, uh, the last talk, you need to manage this server. I mean, who wants to manage? Uh, a server. That's going to bring you trouble when it's um, in under pressure or there's a lot of um, usage. So serverless just removes that from the equation. We don't need to, th to think about the stack. We don't need to think about if it's using a Python or a Node or any other um, uh, stack. We can just build our application and forget about what's happening in the in the server, server side. Um, the next thing is that you don't have to pay for either usage. This is really interesting, because when you uh, set up a server, you probably will uh, get into some kind of contract that will have to be uh, fixed on the, on the usage. But if you're using serverless, you just don't uh, think about these issues. The servers will only be running when you, your users are using the application. If no user is using your application, it's for free. Then another interesting fact is that it's auto-scaling as the demand on your application increases, but not only when it increases, but also when it's not so busy. So that's, that's what is also interesting from serverless. I'm not sure if you are familiar with serverless, so I'm doing a little bit of intro. And then uh, probably the most interesting is that we don't need to take care of this full tolerance and high availability. This is not an easy problem. If you are building your GraphQL API and you are building that from a Node uh, Express uh, server and you are facing some uh, high availability issues, you probably don't have the knowledge to face those. And when you are deploying a new product and you face that uh, after the release, that's going to be very hard on, on your team. So if you don't want to face any of these issues, you can move into uh, serverless and just forget about it. So what I'm going to be using is AWS Amplify. And of course, this is uh, from my team. I mean, is there's some uh, conflict of interest here. But this is the, the tooling I'm going to be using. And this is helping you to build these serverless applications uh, with no much effort. So how it works is um, a platform that supports native and web. And that's going to be iOS, Android, and React Native. And these are uh, all the pieces uh, that will be used. So there's a framework supporting these platforms, developer tools, which uh, will make uh, the job uh, pretty easy. And of course, it will give you access to all of these uh, cloud services. Um, we are talking AWS, but actually, if you want to use the same approach with any other cloud provider that's also uh, interesting. We are talking about a new paradigm. So in the future, in the next year, in the next two years, people will be using serverless more and more, and you don't want to miss that. Uh, on the center, we will use uh, CLI. And this is, this is pretty much standard solution uh, these days. Uh, so it will just help us to, uh, to run some commands and just do the setup for us. 
Okay, in AWS Amplify, we uh, name uh, different features by category, and I'm going to show you some of them. The way it works is you just run a CLI command, amplify at, and then you can use any of these categories, um, and it will scaffold any components and any uh, dependencies that you need on the client and also on the cloud. So that will make the job pretty easy. Today I'm going to be um, developing using the API category. So I will just uh, scaffold my app in any of the frameworks that you may be using and just run Amplify Add. That will do the changes and also set up uh, the services on the cloud. So that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool. For GraphQL, it's also able to create from the schema, which is kind of a standard uh, option, it will create my APIs on the client, but also it will create my server side, which uh, with supporting data tables, uh, which in AWS is DynamoDB. Okay, what, what a, a small intro. Okay, there's more things. <laughs> Sorry about this. Uh, there's also machine learning. Of course, we are talking about a lot of AWS services. There's more than 150 services. We are kind of integrating all of those in uh, AWS Amplify. And now we also have access, just, just a recent uh, release, we got like these five different services that you can use as well. Uh, I'm not using uh, those, but I, I just wanted to show you. Okay, so that's... Uh, the reaction I get usually from people. Uh, no, not much reactions here. Oh my God, you are completely destroyed. <laughs> Bring some coffee for these people. Okay, so let's talk about some details. London uh, Unified API. So London Transport for London uh, created a Unified API to get access to all of the different uh, transport um, options. And one of them, of course, is the bike, the Santander Bikes scheme. Um, so this is a Transport for London. If you have been in London, you are probably familiar with this, uh, with this logo. And we are going to focus into these three different APIs. The first one is going to give us all of the information from all of the dock stations. And we have seen that there are 778, which is uh, accurate because I, I, I've been checking it. And then the second one, it's going to give us the information for just one station. But the problem is that we need to know the ID for that station. Um, there's also this third API is to do a search uh, using the name of the station, but I don't think anybody knows the names of the station unless you are uh, a neighbor of that um, dock station, so it's uh, not that useful. So these are the three APIs that I'm going to focus, uh, mostly on the first two. And the first one is going to give me the information of the coordinates, the geolocation coordinates, so I can put uh, these stations in the map. And then, obviously, when I interact with any of these uh, stations, what I want to know is what's the live data for uh, the number of bikes that I can um, use. So this looks more or less like this. Uh, okay. And this is uh, the response. Of course, this is the response for the whole data set of the 778 stations. So this is some API that we can uh, manage. I mean, I use that API to get all of the coordinates, but I cannot use it like on, on a real-time real basis. It's just too big of a data set. But it looks like this. Um, we have some information uh, identifying uh, the dock station, and then we, we have the number of bikes. This is um, in a kind of a funky format, which comes with a key and value, but then it's, uh, it's kind of uh, denormalized. And then we have the coordinates. Um, we are going to cover the coordinates if you are not familiar with these numbers, um, so don't worry. Uh, for the API that gets uh, the information from one dock station, it looks like this. It just requires the name, the ID of the station. So that's something that you need to, uh, to take into account. And that's basically the same information, but just for one. And that's the one that I, I'm going to be using first. Okay. So, yeah, let's do this. Uh, 
Let's move on. So how I'm going to deal with the information of all the data, uh, all the Docker station is uh, I'm going to gather the information just for the coordinates, and then I'm going to put those coordinates in a layer of my, uh, of my map. So then the user can see where these stations are with no real-time information, and then when there's some interaction, I can bring that number uh, from the live API. So that's the plan. I need to do a few uh, data transformations. And I already showed you the, re uh, the result from that call, Bikes Point. And that's not going to work. When you are using uh, geolocation um, data sets, uh, you, you need to transform that information into some format that other tools um, using geolocation can, uh, can manage. And this is GeoJSON. So GeoJSON is going to provide me that, uh, that data set, but in an in a open format. And for that uh, to happen, I need to create features. So every uh, dock station, it, it will become a feature in a GeoJSON uh, uh, format. So let's see how that looks like. So a feature looks like this. So this is a kind of a, the schema for that uh, feature type. And we are transforming the coordinates into a geometry. And that geometry is uh, a point. And we can facilitate the coordinates uh, just by passing an array. So that's a little bit of data manipulation that I need to do. And any metadata I need to put into the properties uh, entry. So I, I just change some of the fields. I do this so I can then use that information on my map. And that gives me something like this. These are all of the stations. And this is an online tool. It just shows me that my uh, GeoJSON is well formed, so I can, uh, I can check it out. Of course, that's not something I can use in my app, but it just, it just shows me that it's working. So let's, let's introduce coordinates. So when you are using coordinates, we, are just, uh, we just want to point uh, geolocation in the map so we can share that information and then show it displayed in our map. So one thing that we are going to use is longitude and latitude coordinates. And as you can see, the center of this um, system is somehow south of Africa. It's like in the middle of nowhere. But somehow it's very, it's very close to Europe. I don't know who decided because there's no reference in the world. But this, this is quite an uh, occidental uh, view of the world. If you, for some reason, you go to Australia or Asia, they shift the map. So you go to a coffee place, they will shift the map so the center will be Australia, for example. So this is a little bit uh, funny. But yeah, this is the, the coordinates that we are going to be using. And uh, for that is going to uh, for London is going to give us something around this uh, longitude and latitude. So this is one of the stations that I'm going to be uh, showing. So it's a little bit uh, on the negative side from uh, from zero for the longitude, and it's more or less between 50 and 60 um, on the latitude. Of course, if you have this, then you can translate more or less from a coordinates to a map. And we are going to use um, this format, which is from the GeoJSON, which is longi uh, longitude and then latitude in that, in that order. So if you see a coordinate, it will be longitude, latitude. Very good. On the client, I decided to use Mapbox. And my main, my main criteria was um, the easiest uh, setup. Uh, the other option is Google Maps, I guess, but Google Maps uh, requires to enter uh, your credit card details, and the setup is a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, of course, Google Maps have more features, but I decided to use Mapbox because it was easier. So then anyone that wants to play with it, it will be easier for them as well. So there's a few things I need to do by using Mapbox. The first thing is Mapbox requires a source, and that will be all of these um, coordinates from the different uh, dock stations. And the other thing that Mapbox uses is layers. So every time that I show some um, 
feature on the map, it will be on a layer, and then the source will have this data from a GeoJSON file. And this is the result. So this is now in my uh, client, and I can, I can show these, uh, these features on the map. Okay, so this is the first stage. We got all of the dock stations in a, in a map that I can show to the user, and now we are going to build the first interaction. The first interaction is going to be uh, point to a dock station and get the real-time data. But so far, we are good. We are the, the captains of the geolocation world. So how are we going to do this REST API integration? Um, we're going to use um, the schema that is going to uh, create all of the APIs on the, on the server side. And to do that, I'm going to use this uh, type definition. And if you see, there's this add model uh, GraphQL transform, which is not part of the standard. This comes from AWS AppSync. And that's going to create all of the APIs and also create filters. It's also going to create the input types for the different CRUD operations. It's going to do all of that work, which some of the tools that we can see in GraphQL are also offering, but it's also going to create the data tables supporting those, which is uh, pretty awesome. Here, what I did to integrate uh, with the REST API from uh, Transport for London is I just added a field, and then this field is going to do a HTTP request and getting that information uh, live. So that's the only change that I had to do, at least on, uh, on my schema. On the, the way it works with AWS AppSync is that I can access my resolvers and I have two uh, points where I can change uh, both the request and the response uh, for um, GraphQL query. So I'm going to use that resolver for that bike point bikes field and I'm going to change that to do the HTTP request that I uh, require. So that's going to do the translation. Uh, that translates into a data source in AWS AppSync, and it's going to do that call that we saw on the APIs. Okay, uh, the context is the context of the GraphQL query. So if you are familiar with that, you will, uh, you will make, uh, you will join the dots. The next thing that I want to use is the response. So the response in this case is going to be the response from that HTTP request. Um, and that result is going to uh, check uh, if there is um, a 200 uh, status code, and then I'm going to just dig in into the data and bring back uh, that value back to the query. Um, of course, this is using GraphQL um, resolvers infrastructure, and then if there is any uh, mistake, it's going to return no. Um, maybe you are not familiar, this is a BTL uh, template, it's uh, pretty common in Java, uh, and it's just a template uh, engine that you can, uh, you can uh, add your logic in there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's going to return that value live. <coughs> not bad. I also added some animations here for good measure. Let's enjoy this for a moment. This is CSS. I don't know if you use CSS these days. Very good. It's just a small break. So let's add the search. This is more the most interesting bit. And what happens is, OK, we have the coordinates. And we can check. Let's do, before I go into the search, let's do, um, let's see the feature live. So we have the map with all the information of the different um, dock stations. And what we, are, um, what we are doing now is, OK, I can point now to one of these uh, dock stations. I can interact with it. And it will just make the call, because now I know the ID. And it will just get the number of bikes that are available. This is live. This is coming from the Transport for London API. So this is uh, the feature that I built so far. If I query another station, it will just do that query that we saw. I'm just interacting with the map. That's, that's the only thing. And 
The next thing is the search. So for the search, we have a problem now. And if you think about uh, what will be the next thing to, to do, is probably you will say like, okay, so I want, to, I want to help the user, but I don't want to get the 778 uh, dock stations. That's just too much. And then I need to calculate, because probably I just want to take like the 500 meters around the location of the user. How are you going to do that? And I want you to think about solving that problem. So one thing is you need to know where the user is, which, okay, I can do it. I have this control, this is from Mapbox, and it's going to find my location, whoop. Of course the location <laughs> is in Paris, so this is, this is not good. But of course when you are using this in, in London, it will just, uh, Try to, find, try to find the stations around you. So this is good. I mean, it's, it's not bad. The only thing is that it, we, are not, we are not in London now. So let me deactivate that and go back. I use this control just to get me back to London. Look at this. This is probably the best feature. Whoa. This animation is very smooth. I mean, we are using WebGL. Mapbox is really good because it's using WebGL and it's giving you that smooth uh, animation. But here I have this point like a fake location and I can find the bikes around that point. But the calculations um, are pretty intense. If you have done that problem and tried to solve it with JavaScript or any other language, you know that it's going to take quite a bit of time. And also, if you are doing that for the 778 um, coordinates, that's not going to work, unfortunately. Not on the client, at least. So let's see how we can fix that. This is just a technical problem. So let's see how we can do it with AWS AppSync. What we can do in, in uh, our schema is we can add this at searchable. And by adding that uh, GraphQL um, directive there, I can do, I can indicate to AWS AppSync to add Elasticsearch uh, support for this type. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I also need to add the support for the location. So this is going to be the bit here. And this is because Elasticsearch requires a field with this latitude and longitude. So I'm going to add that to support uh, Elasticsearch, and I'm going to add a new query, which I'm going to use uh, the location where the user is, or any location that will serve uh, as the center. Then I use meters, so I will use, like in my application, I use 500 meters. And then I also want to limit uh, how much uh, results I get back from that query. I don't want to get like all the all the data sets, so that's going to help me um, to deal with that. Okay. So we need to do a little bit more uh, data transformation. I need to run this query into my GraphQL API. This is the uh, bikes nearby, and that's going to go into Elasticsearch, which we'll have to get all of these Docker uh, coordinates um, indexed, and then when I run a search, it will be able to run these calculations for me. So let's see how that works. The first thing that I have to do is I need to create an index that is going to give me that uh, calculations like pretty, pretty fast. And the way you do it is you create a property in your index that will be of type GeoPoint. That will allow me to do these uh, searches. So let's see how, how that will work. Once I, once I have the index created, and just by adding that at searchable, I now have the option to create uh, new bike points. And every time that I create one uh, new entry for that type, it's going to add that information into my Elasticsearch index. This is happening automatically. So the moment I create uh, by using a mutation, is going to sync that with my index, which is pretty awesome. 
Then the next thing that I, I want to show you is how a search will look like. And this is a search on Elasticsearch. And here I do a query which uh, should match all of the um, documents in my index. And this is when it gets interesting. I'm using a filter and then I'm translating my query into a search into uh, Elasticsearch. And I'm using also this distance. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit more, but this arc is going to give me uh, the distance as if the Earth was an sphere, which is an approximation of the actual um, situation here to calculate distances. And then, of course, I also want to sort the results. I mean, if I get the results scrambled, I mean, that wouldn't, that wouldn't help. And what I want is that the most close uh, to my location, that will be first. So this is how you do it. And all of these calculations will be done on the Elasticsearch index. I mean, if you have used an index uh, on, the, on a database, you know that this is going to be really, really fast. Let me show you, let me show you how fast that is. So I have this environment, this is Kibana, and it shows me um, an environment where I can run these queries. And I'm going to take um, a big query. I'm going to just include everything. OK, it took six milliseconds. Let's see again. Maybe it's an error. OK, no, it took 10. It was a little bit of this time, but it's really, really fast. Of course, I'm not going to get this type of performance because I also need to do the HTTP request to get the live data, but at least the geolocation data, which is what stations are closest to me, that's going to be very, far, very fast. Look at this, there's so many possibilities. Oh my God. So how we do the distance calculations, this is not easy. I mean, if you want to do this with uh, Python or if you want to do it with JavaScript, I mean, try to do that for the 778 uh, coordinates. Good luck. Of course, this is what I'm using. So my, uh, my solution with Elasticsearch is giving me all of that in 10 milliseconds. I don't know if you have realized about the quality of my solution. And this is exactly how it looks in Java. And this is the, the actual implementation from Elasticsearch. I dig a little bit because if this is open source. I just dig in a little bit in the source code. And this is actual, the actual implementation you are seeing here. Good luck if you want to implement this in JavaScript for 778 coordinates, and you also need to request that with a, with a call to the API, I mean, that's going to take forever. Very good. We are in a good jam here. Okay, so I demonstrate that. Let's see in a very quick um, demonstration how that looks and how is the performance for this. Okay, this is not 10 milliseconds, but of course it's because it has to do the HTTP request and there's no way to catch it. So unfortunately, I haven't found a solution for that. Um, one thing that I included to my solution be, uh, besides the find my location is that you can type, of course, imagine you are in London, you want to find what's the situation, for example, in Covent Garden. Or maybe you want to know what's um, in a certain location, or this is too close. Okay, let's uh, maybe London Bridge. So this is also very interesting. You can uh, use this geocoder. This is from Mapbox, and I can introduce, of course, you don't know London. You are, you are visiting London, you don't know, but you may know some, uh, uh, some hotel or maybe a, a street or a famous place. And this is a, a way to navigate the map. And I can do the same. I can run the query from here. OK, I hope I don't push it too much. All right.
Okay, that's, that's the end, I guess. Very good. If you want to know more, somehow it didn't work in the second try, uh, no worries. Here, these are some people that are um, developing on AWS Amplify and AWS AppSync that you should know about. And um, that's all. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for that talk. Uh, I've seen a few of the AWS demos, and they're always just mind-blowing on what's possible with serverless functions. I think you got struck by the conference Wi-Fi gods. Yeah, maybe. They probably saw the time, and they were like, ah, sorry, mate. So, yeah, no, uh, it's dead. <laughs> it's dead. OK. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> definitely check out the demo. It's open source, right? You yes. have it online. Yes, you and, have it on um, my uh, yeah, GitHub. Don't do have or sign formulas on the client. Just be nice to your customers. That's not nice. So uh, very <laughs> okay. good. So thank you. Big hand of applause for Gerard. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, sabotage him by the coffee. <laughs>